Good morning. Uh, my name is Rick Champ. Uh, Josh Conley, your pastor, invited me to speak this morning. I want to thank Josh and thank you for letting me be here and uh, celebrate this Sunday morning with you as we gather. Though I've not been here on a Sunday morning before, I've been in the building several times as I've met with Josh. Uh, and I'll mention later, I have roots a little bit further south. So sometimes when I decide not to take the interstate and take the back roads, I, I come up 37. And when I do, I'll often drive around Kimundi and pray for you. Um, I know some of your story over the past few years and the impact you're having in this community, in this region, and God is blessing you and using you to touch so many lives with the good news of, of Jesus Christ, to bring new life uh, to people. Uh, so I, I've been praying for you and the work that God is doing uh, through you. Um, as we begin this morning, I, l- let me check and see, uh, how many baseball fans do we have in the room. A few baseball fans? Okay. I, I want to begin with sort of a word association or really a letter association. Uh, I, I'll mention uh, three letters and, and let me know if you know what they mean. Uh, but you know, if I, I ask if there's baseball fans, I've got to do this, this informal survey. How many Cardinal fans are in the room? Okay. You love baseball, don't you? Uh, how many Cub fans? Oh, very few. Oh. <laughs> My people, I mean, I'm a Cardinal fan, so uh, I, I often speak in churches a little farther north, and I've asked that question, it's either a little more balanced or tipped to the evil kingdom. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so here, here's a few letters, and let me know if you know what they mean, uh, if you're baseball fans, RBI, yes, and you can say it out loud, this is, um, ERA, Earn run average, MVP. Okay, let's try a few other letters that are government-based and see if you know the CIA. Good, FBI. And and those three letters you hope you never get a letter from? (laughs) Yeah, you're ahead of me, aren't you? The IRS, uh, Internal Revenue Services. Um, there's, there's, there's another three letters that, that being this region, you may be familiar with. Uh, they're not baseball related or government related, but if I say FFA, Future Farmers of America. How, how many in the room have been a Future Farmer of America? Any of you were part of that? I, I, I grew up a little bit further south from here, a little town called Woodlawn. Some of you may know it, down by Mount Vernon. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, every freshman boy, and I was a freshman boy, had to take one year of FFA. Now, my grandfather was a farmer, and I knew how hard farmers worked. Now, in my high school, also, there was another thing that every freshman girl took for at least a year called FHA. Those of us of a certain age know what that is, Future Homemakers of America. I don't think they have that anymore quite the same as they did then, where they separated boys who they thought would be farmers and girls they thought would be homemakers. Um, As a freshman boy, though, I thought, what sounds more interesting? Spending an hour a day with 30 future farmers or 30 future homemakers? I mean, at 15, what sounds more interesting, right? Right? Well, I tried to register for FHA, thinking that would be a lot more interesting, but but alas, being a small school, and the secretary, and the principal, and the superintendent, knowing my family, I was a future farmer for one year. Those three letters, F-H-A, uh, we're going to work with this morning. We're not going to talk about future homemakers. We're not going to talk about any of that. But, but at the end of today, I want those three letters to sort of be, be branded a little bit on your soul. Because one of the things we understand about the gospel, we understand about our Christian faith, we understand about being a part of, of the kingdom of God, is we're told that by Jesus in John 10.10, 10, I have come to give you life and life more full. It isn't just about what's going to happen to us someday. When we die, though we have the assurance of that blessed hope of of eternal life and the presence of God, and and that's meaningful and that's important and that's that's valuable to have and sense. But what we understand is the good news of the gospel, the good news 
of Jesus is about having life now. When he said, I've come to give you life, it's the same phrase for eternal life. I've come to give you eternal life now. I want you to begin experiencing it now and experiencing it fully now. So the, the three letters that we're going to work with, FHA, are, are things that if we, we incorporate into our lives will help us begin to embrace and experience that life a little more consistently than maybe we have in the past. So we're going to focus on three words. The first word will start with F. The second word will start with and the third word will start with, you guys are, you guys have had your coffee this morning or, or your diet Mountain Dew in my case. Uh, so the first word will start with F. It is, it is focus, focus. Uh, consider these words written by uh, the writer of Hebrews in the first few verses. It says, therefore, since we have been surrounded, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix or focus our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Fix or focus your eyes on Jesus. Choose what you're going to look at. Or as Eugene Peterson translates that, that passage in Hebrews, keep your eyes on Jesus who began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it because he never lost sight of where he was headed. What is most important to us? That is our focus. That is what we choose to focus our attention on. What is most important? As a great theologian, Winnie the Pooh once said, Sometimes the smallest things take up the most room in our hearts. What you focus on takes up room in your heart. What is most important to you? One of the things that fascinates me is, as, as I've been reading and studying and, and, and considering life over the past few years, is I think one of the greatest challenges to experiencing that fullness of life that God calls us to isn't stuff on the outside. It isn't consumerism. It isn't secularism. It isn't those changes in the culture around us. One of the things that keep us from experiencing the life fully that God calls us to is busyness, is how busy we are. And that busyness distracts us and causes us to drift from what is most important. And some of you relate to this. I'm amazed. I have three small kids, or uh, three grown grown children who are adults now that have, have kids. But I, I look back at, at when they were little compared to young families now with young children and, and the schedule you have with young children of all the things that are going on, all the activities, amazes me. Uh, I, I look at my friends who, who have retired and they often will often say, I am more busy in retirement than I was when I was working full time. What is it that fills our time, that fills our attention, that fills our focus? Because if we're not intentional about what we are giving our life to, we begin dr to drift from what is most important. That's true for individuals. That's true for you as couples, as families, and it's true as a church. Because a church can be very busy, but the busyness can cause them from drift to drift from what is most important. I, I want to give you an image to, to consider. Oftentimes when we talk about all the activities we have going on in our lives, we talk about our schedule, we often talk about having to juggle. I don't know what gave you that idea. You guys are sharp. You're anticipating where I'm going with this stuff. Uh, we often talk about juggling our, our schedules. Now there's an interesting thing about juggling. You don't look at the balls when you juggle. You cannot watch three things moving at once. You don't. What you do is you pick a point of reference beyond the balls. And, and when you have that point of reference, it brings everything else into focus. And you can see, that, see it and allows you to keep things in rhythm and in pattern that keeps things moving. So, oh, you thought I was going to juggle? <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll give it a shot. We'll give it a shot. But when you juggle, you pick a point of reference beyond. And when you do that, you can see all 
that's going on around you, in front of you, and keep that rhythm and keep that pattern sometimes. But if you take your eyes off that, what you focus on, and try and watch the balls, they fall apart. The rhythm goes. The pattern goes. Uh, my friends, that's what life is like. If we don't choose what we're going to focus on, if we're going to choose what is most important to us, and allow that to be the focal point that gives meaning to everything else, and a pattern to everything else, and a rhythm to everything else in life, we're going to drop it. It will catch up with us. So, so focus. We've got to choose what is the most important. That's true, again, for, for us as individuals, as couples, as families, and as a church. Because if we don't intend, int, can continue to intentionally make that choice, we will drift from our focus and we'll never experience the life that God is calling us to. Focus. The second word begins with H. It's a word I don't like, but it's the word habit. We need to develop some habits in our life that will help us keep focus. Because we can't keep focus without habits that drive us to that, that reinforce that. Um, to give an example of that is, is how many of you drove here today? Okay, many of you drove here today. How many of you thought about what you were doing while you drove? There's, okay, the one or two that raised your hands, I want you to leave. Let me leave first. You know where I'm going with this. I mean, do you remember what it's like to learn to drive or to teach your, your, your child, son or daughter or grandson and granddaughter to drive? You have to think about everything you do, don't you? You have to think about, about how to steer, how much to steer, how quickly to steer. It's not like, like, like uh, video games. Uh, how much pressure to put on the gas pedal, when to lift off your, your foot off the gas pedal, put it on the brake. When, if, you, if you're driving a straight shift, you know how to use the clutch. You have to think about everything that, with, with that rather than letting it flow. Uh, a couple years ago, I, I have um, uh, five grandkids. They're the cutest grandkids ever. Cue all the pictures for the next 10 minutes. No. Uh, I, I, I learned when I had my first grandchild, the way to start like a riot with a bunch of people who are grandparents is claim yours is the cutest. Because you all think yours are, but they're not. <laughs> Mine are. But Declan, uh, who is now, he'll be, um, he'll be six in October. When he was about four years old, I was hanging out with him, and he was, we were driving. He was in the back seat, uh, locked into his car seat, not like my kids used to be. <laughs> you know, hanging in the back window or something. <laughs> <laughs> He's sitting in the car seat, and we're driving up, and, and, and about a block away is a street light, and it turns red. And from the back seat, I hear Declan as a four-year-old go, Papa, the light turned red. Take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake. <laughs> I thought, that's amazing. At four years old, he knows how to drive. Then I thought, how is my daughter driving that my four-year-old knows <laughs> that you're supposed to take your foot off the gas and put it on the brake? But we, we don't think about what we do when we drive. Because it's a habit. It's something, a habit is something you do consistently so that the behavior you're doing becomes natural to you. It's just a part of who you are and it flows when you need to do it. You do it the right way at the right time. It's like when you watch baseball players or athletes still who've been playing for years take infield or batting practice. They keep doing that so that the right moment, the right time, they can react the right way. And that's what habits are. In the, in, the, in the Christian life, when we choose our focus, to focus on Jesus and what is most important to us, the habits are what we often call the spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. The, the things that you often do already. Prayer, worship, service, solitude. Well, I would mention fasting, but none of us like that one, so we'll move that off to the side. But fasting, those spiritual practices or spiritual disciplines, those practices help us form that into our lives in a way that help us keep the focus. One of the practices that, that I have tried to incorporate into my life, and I, I'm not consistent at this. I'm not as consistent as, as, as I, I would like to be. But it's, it's often, to, to make it sound fancy, we can call it the queries, which is Latin for questions. Asking yourself some questions. And one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and, and one, if you listen to me, preach or teach often, I'll invariably bring into almost everything, is, is found in Micah. 
Uh, the, the minor prophet Micah, the sixth chapter, the eighth verse, it traditionally is translated something like this. O, o, o mortal, or o, o man, what does the Lord require and what is good? To live justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. Uh, and to go back to Eugene Peterson, who I mentioned earlier, Peterson translates it this way. But he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. It's quite simple. Do what is fair and just to your neighbor. Be compassionate, loyal in your love. And don't take yourself too seriously. Take God seriously. So what I've tried to do is, is ask myself questions built around that. Am I being fair and just to my neighbor? Am I being compassionate, loyal in my love? Am I taking myself too seriously? Or am I taking God seriously? And by asking, having the habit of asking those questions to myself, it drives home what the focus of my life should be and needs to be for me to experience and to embrace the life that Christ wants to give me or wants me to know. So, focus, habits. Third word starts with A, and I don't like this word either. Um, accountability. You, you see, we need habits to keep us in focus so we can experience the life that God wants us to experience. But to keep those habits going, we need accountable relationships. We need people in our lives who will encourage us and challenge us, walk alongside us, so that we can keep those habits going. It's like if you've ever tried to work out, if you work out with a, with a friend, it's easier to work out because you have somebody you're doing it with. Somebody you're doing it with together. You cannot keep focused with the habits, you cannot keep habits going without accountability. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, the writer says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. We need each other. We were created by a God who has a community as Father, Son, and Spirit, and we're created into community, and we need each other. In fact, in the New Testament, New Testament writers, 59 times, at least 59 times, uses the one another statements. Love one another, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another, show compassion to one another. One another, we are meant to be in relationship together. Now, uh, for me, I have to be intentional about this because I, I, I love the quotation from uh, a Jesuit priest and poet decades ago by the name of Daniel Berrigan who said, I'm a loner by nature, but in community by discipline. Because I can be a loner at times, and I think I can do it on my own at times. I remember once a few years ago going through a difficult time and I was talking to a friend after that and telling him some of what's been going on in my life and he goes, champ, you have to tell me these things. I cannot be there for you if you don't tell me. So if you don't mind, I want to take just a moment to talk to people like me in this room. And by people like me, I mean primarily men in this room because we have this tendency, for whatever reason, we have this tendency to think we can do it on our own, don't we? Or is it only me? We think we can handle anything. We don't need somebody beside us. We don't need to talk about what's going on and let alone talk about our feelings. We can do it on our own, but the reality is we can't. We need each other. As the proverb says, iron sharpens iron. We need each other. So all of us, men, women, young, old, need somebody in our life they can be there to encourage us, to challenge us, have permission to ask those difficult questions at times that we will listen to and ponder and wrestle with. Because if you want life and the life that God has promised that we can begin to experience and encounter in Christ, we need to keep our focus. But we can't keep our focus with our habits. and We can't have our habits consistently without those accountable relationships. Who do you have in your life that you've given permission to come alongside and ask you difficult questions? Are you a part of a group, 
part of a small group, part of a Sunday school class, part of, of, of a long time friendship where that can take place and those conversations happen, you, you need that. You need it. So if you want to experience life, you need those accountable relationships because those will help you keep the habits going. They'll help you keep the focus. They'll help you encounter and embrace life. And life is what it's about because Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more full. My prayer for you this morning is that you will consider what is my focus? What is most important to me? What is going to be that point of reference I look to beyond all the activities in my life? For some of you, it's about beginning a journey following Jesus. He's been drawing you to himself and you sense that and you need to say yes. Go, that will be it. And today will be a day that I begin that journey. I take that next step. For some of you, you've been following Jesus, but, but there's things you know you need to get over more fully. And take those steps. For some of you, it, it may be that, you know what, I, I, I know the focus I want, but, but I don't have the habits in my life that drive that focus. I, I, I want to begin practicing those. And, and, and for some, it means I, I need to find people that can come alongside me and encourage me and challenge me and be there with me so I keep the habits going and I keep the focus in place so that I can experience life more fully. We all are somewhere in that continuum. Where are you and how will you respond this morning? Pray with me. Father, we're grateful, so grateful for your love, for the grace you pour in and through us, through Jesus Christ. We're grateful for the life that you offer through him. May we each today open our hearts a little more to you. May we look honestly at ourselves and where we are. Allow you to speak into us a little more that through the worship this morning, through the conversations we have, that you will shape us a little bit more into the men and women you desire us to be, that we might know life a little more this day because of what you're doing this morning. In your son's name, amen.